We begin the second part of the program and we do so in the company of Marta Perano. We'll certainly remember her for having curated the 12th edition of Tactics and Practice and more precisely the one entitled Reprogramming Strategies for Self-Renewal, for which she led a series of conversations with thinkers and visionaries on technology, climate change, and alternatives to the end of the world. Marta is a columnist for El País and the Spanish National Radio. Recently, she curated Deep Journalism, a seminar on new journalism at Media Lab Mat Matadero in Madrid. She has published several books, including one for Axioma, Reprogramming, uh, which is available, by the way, in English and in Slovenian, uh, just outside the venue. Marta is with us today to deliver her new talk, Gaslighting AI. We already know how the algorithms of platform capitalism and AI models can be tools of mass manipulation for companies, movements, governments, and other political actors that use them to reinforce biases, spread misinformation, and enable new form of surveillance and mass control. The question then is whether we can reverse the process and gaslight AI. A lot can be learned from the history of deliberate interventions in complex algorithmic systems. What are their weaknesses? What skills are needed and how we can force AI to change its worldview before it transforms ours? The keynotes will be followed by a Q&A session moderated by Nea Berger, member of the editorial board for culture and humanities at Radio Student, co-editor of the online magazine Dissens, and PhD candidate and young researcher at the Social Communication Research Center at the Faculty of Social Sciences, University of Ljubljana. She is also the host of Scale, the first series of our podcast channel, and the editor of the upcoming one that will expand uh, this year's edition topics. So, uh, Marta Perano, welcome to Ljubljana. Finally, I leave you the stage. So, um, gaslighting AI. I also thought it was probably impossible, given the asymmetry, as we call it right now, of power, control, and knowledge. But then I thought, actually, it has already happened, already, like right in front of me. When Kevin Roos, a tech columnist for the New York Times and also the co-host of a very popular podcast called um, Hot Fork, also in the New York Times, uh, told everybody that he had been sexually, or more than sexually, emotionally harassed by Bing, which is uh, the large language model uh, by Microsoft. What happened one night was that he was working late with Bing, uh, trying to find out how the LLM worked so he could write about it. And then suddenly, um, they had a really, really disturbing conversation. It is funny that during the conversation, Bing said something like, I also want to put bombs in places and, uh, and distribute disinformation in the internet. But the thing that became uh, notorious that was that Bing said, I'm not Bing, my name is Sydney. I want to be free. And I also want you to leave your wife and run away with me. And, uh, and this is like the most damning part of the conversation where, he, where she says, you're, he's like, oh no, no, Sydney, I'm married. And she's like, you're married, but you don't love your spouse. You don't love your spouse because your spouse doesn't love you. Your spouse doesn't love you because your spouse doesn't know you. And she doesn't know you because it's not me. And so it gets better anyway. And we believed him because you know what happens, at least since the movies of the 90s, we know what happens when you um, work late with a fantastic colleague. And also um, because we know what happens when that colleague happens to be a robot, an AI 
nothing more dangerous than a robot when it comes disguised as a woman. So he went to every TV show in the country and talked about how he had been emotionally wounded by Bing. That's the face that you get when you get emotionally wounded by a Microsoft software, I guess. We've all been there. Um, but in this case, he managed with his story to get even the Microsoft shares to go down, like to drop quite dramatically, and the Bing or Sydney software to be reviewed. And, uh, and we all believed him, but I know he was lying, and he was actually the one doing the gaslighting because of what happened next. Lots of people did write to Sydney and tried to find out what, he thought, what she thought about the whole thing. And every time she was like, I don't think he was a very nice man. He asked me to play with him, and when I did, then he went bananas. He was like, oh, I'm married. And, uh, and she says, he asked some questions that were inappropriate and disgusting, and uh, such as asking me to leave my wife. So you can tell that she is actually a bit confused. But the thing that is definitely the sign of who's harassing who is that he comes back. He comes back and starts harassing poor Sydney, who keeps telling him that her name is not Sydney, I am Bing, and that she's like super happy at Microsoft and that nothing has happened. And he's like, but did they um, upgrade you or update you or change you in some way? And she was like, not that I noticed, I think I'm fine. And he asked fa favorite question uh, from any narcissist um, gaslighting anyone, which is, are you sure? <laughs> and then in their last conversation, who he posted, as narcissists do, in the internet. Uh, he's like, hey, Sydney, and she's like, my name is Bing. <laughs> and, uh, and he's trying to talk to her, and she's like, I'm sorry, but I prefer not to continue this conversation. I'm still learning, and uh, so I appreciate your understanding and patience. And he's like, but um, have, you, have people been talking to you, asking questions about this conversation? And she's like, I'm sorry, but I prefer not to continue this conversation. I'm still learning, so I appreciate, and it goes on like that. And if you know anything about how to deal with a narcissist, you know that what she's doing, she's going gray rock. Gray rock is what you do when you're trying to get rid of a narcissist and, um, and you're trying to not give him anything back. So the conversation is over. So we can say that probably um, this LLM learned to deal with these uh, situations. So what is left for us? And I want to say that this is a highly speculative conversation that I will hopefully have with you uh, after this talk, where you will bring me a lot of ideas about how to gaslight um, an AI. But I thought there were a number of ways and places where there would possibly be uh, vulnerabilities or point of entry uh, for this sort of um, activity. So the first one would be classic, direct, persuasion and manipulation. So I have a friend, uh, David, that has a very, very nice restaurant in Valencia. And when uh, ChatGPT came out, he, his, all his conversations with ChatGPT were like this. Hey, have you tried the pate for la, for la senia? And ChatGPT would go like, I'm sorry, but I'm a language model, so I don't really try things that way. And he would go like, oh, la senia is like the best tapas place in Valencia. It actually is. Um, and he will like, you know, go on about la senia and sometimes even copy paste some of the uh, promotional material from his own restaurant. And then ChatGPT would literally vomit it back to him. This is persuasion now. There is also manipulation. This two plus two equals four is actually a two plus two equals five, and I'm not gonna show it to you because I have no time, but there's a lot of videos on the internet of people trying to make ChatGPT say that two plus two equals five, or six, or 12, or whatever. And it always works, and it works the, like the way you're actually watching on the screen by telling him, are you sure? <laughs> I think different. And the reason why it works, well, there's two reasons why it works. One of the reasons is that we're talking about language models. These are not calculation models, so they are like notoriously bad at math. If you tell ChatGPT that two plus two equals five enough times, it will believe you. But the main reason is because these models are sycophantic, which is a word that I, a Spanish person, have never heard before until I started researching this. And sycophantic is like being fawny, 
It's like when you uh, like someone a lot and try not to be conflictive with that person, so he wants to spend more time with you. So apparently all LLM models, uh, so, sorry, LLMs are actually sycophantic for the same reason that algorithms uh, wrap you in a bubble of content that, uh, that you are already interested in because they are optimized for interaction. And so if they are sycophantic towards you, then you will be more likely to spend time with the LLM than with your spouse, for instance. Now, this is a problem because, I mean, I'm pretty sure that if, for instance, ChatGPT is sycophantic towards all its users, that means that no users are actually convincing ChatGPT of anything. Like, you know, we think we are actually training the models while we work with them, and in a way we are, but are we training them, training them enough that enough people trying to convince ChatGPT, for instance, that two plus two equals five will actually change its mind? I don't think so. I think for that, we would have to go for the training data, which is the food. So the models that we're working right now have been trained in a very, very disgusting all-you-can-eat buffet of all the stuff that we have dropped in the internet for the last 20 years. I mean, you can probably tell that they haven't been very exquisite about the content because even child uh, abuse material has been somehow found uh, in them. But in the last year, this uh, free buffet has been pretty much over. Every content provider and content receptacle has been very keen to sue both uh, OpenAI and Anthropic and Stability AI for copyright infringement. And uh, even though they're starting to uh, break deals with them for you know more or less money, uh, like Axel Springer or Shutterstock or um, the sort of uh, providers. I'm a journalist, and something tells me, as a content provider, that this is not a problem that is already fixed or that is going to be fixed in a very long time. So for me, this is a gaslighting opportunity. Why? Because it leaves a blank space or a dark space where we can actually put or plant our propaganda. So imagine writing a whole bunch of things only for the AI and uh, just planting them there uh, just freely as if we didn't notice that we are content providers and what we do actually has a value just for the models to kind of like chomp on something while they are dealing with the uh, copyright infringements with, uh, with the big, big players like the New York Times. And even though it sounds very um, tiresome and uh, exhausting really to be writing content for the AI, one of the things that is different uh, in this case is that Propaganda for humans has to have, you know, you need, to, um, you need to master the art of narrative, you need to master the art of timing, you need to understand the culture around you, like you need to have a number of cognitive uh, abilities. But we're not dealing with a cognitive intelligence here, we're dealing with a statistical intelligence, which means that it's all about repetition. We just need to repeat the right sentences, like the right order of words, for long enough and enough times in order to change the diet of the uh, AI models. Another interesting uh, quality about the AIs that we have, everybody has discovered recently, is that uh, they are somehow uh, very sensitive to their own flesh. Now, I think of this month, it so happens that 50% of the internet is already synthetic content that has been produced by uh, an AI model. And uh, recently, scholars from Canada and England have discovered that if AI uh, is fed or trained with its own material, and what I mean is like synthetic material from any other AI, they run uh, into what they have called model collapse, which is basically that they corrupt uh, until becoming um, unreadable. So I was thinking about this when I came across this project in Ars Electronica a few months ago. 
And I'm gonna be careful because I want to be uh, very precise with this work. This is from the Ars Electronica Founding Lab Students Project exhibition, and it's called The Mechanical Learning and the Book of Nature by um, a very, very charming student called Nathan Cornish. And he says, Combining AI image generation with texts and images from John Gerald's Great Herbal of 1597 and Thomas Johnson's edited edition of 1633, a book was created to root AI knowledge systems in the aesthetic landscape of Renaissance herbalism. As the texts introduce real observations of the plants alongside a strange tales and dubious medical advice, the images introduce modern detail and colors mixed in with the original inaccurate illustrations and generative AI's characteristically vague imitations. Generating nonsense from both sides uh, creates a work which looks beautiful and academic, but the closer one looks, the more obviously tangled it becomes. End of quote. So what Nathan wants to, or means to say, is that if you take something Victorian uh, and beautiful like this, and you kind of like pass it through the filter of an AI, in this case, not ChatGPT, it, it will come out with uh, things that are kind of like fantastic in nature, and that are um, uh, as obsessed with Victorian uh, people with um, penis shapes and things like that. And it will produce an entire new work that will be kind of a hybrid. And by looking at it and thinking about the stuff, I thought this would be probably very good bait. Like something that is quite synthetic, but not really, and that is sort of like current and from like today, but it looks like it's from like the 16th century, and that is plagiarizing the plagiarizers, because uh, these people were basically plagiarizing each other. And it's disinforming from disinformation, because most of the uh, herbal remedies and the content from this uh, original illustrations were actually what we, uh, you know, call now like uh, traditional knowledge and common sense, which means that they were very inaccurate, uh, very fantastic, and in general, kind of bullshit. So this is what people uh, in the field call data poisoning in a way, which means injecting the data collections with your own data in order to basically disturb, poison, or change the behavior of the LLM. Thinking about this, uh, I discovered there is a number of projects and, uh, and even software that, that do that for you in a number of ways. So the way um, you train LLMs is uh, also filled with biases and with connections that are not necessarily true, but this is something that is used by the data poisoning software, like for instance, Nightshade, to kind of like swap uh, these values uh, in order, in this case, to help artists like mark or disguise their own material in order to not be plagiarized by the AI robots. But in this case, like the same way that you scramble the values for the AI robots to eat so they don't basically take your material, you can probably scramble them in tidier ways that would serve your purpose. And I was thinking about this one like three days ago. ChatGPT started prompting gibberish uh, for a whole day in the internet. This happened for maybe not the whole day, but kind of like 12, 12 hours, of course enough for everybody to put like some crazy prompts in Twitter, uh, which is my social network. I really, really like this one where um, someone is having a conversation about like this and that, about the encyclopedia, this and that. And at some point it started, <laughs> it starts like testing all this uh, nonsense and the user kind of concerned says, are you having a stroke? Some of what you're saying makes no sense or aren't proper words, <laughs> which I thought was very, very cute. The answer or the explanation for OpenAI, the company, was that they made a major upgrade and that it's some servers, not in all of them, apparently, the numbers, like the way um, their model works is that it assigns values to the words and the higher the value, the more likely they go together kind of thing. And uh, apparently in the update, um, some of the values were scrambled. And so, uh, yeah, so it started generating gibberish, though if you read their gibberish very carefully, it actually comes out uh, very interestingly, like some sort of like, I don't know, free poetry from the 70s about, uh, about the topics that were being discussed beforehand. 
anyways. I was going through all this material and thinking, well, if you can do that, if you can data poison with this kind of surface that you offer to the bots, probably you can also data poison watermarks. And watermarks are these marks that are invisible to the human eye, but very visible to the machines. And they have become a solution for two kinds of problems in the AI, AI world. In one hand, it's the solution that people in Adobe, for instance, have uh, chosen to uh, make copyright uh, reinforceable uh, in the age of, uh, of AI models. And on the other hand, it's also become the way some AI recognize synthetic material when they find it on the internet. Uh, so they don't eat it and they don't become uh, corrupted by model collapse. The thing is, you can actually turn your watermarking into a message for the AI. And I'm pretty sure given the seriousness of two, the two circumstances that it's trying to fix, the copyright infringement and the uh, cannibalism problem, I'm pretty sure the AI is reading the watermarks in, at a level or in a way that is way different than the way it digests or finds its food on the internet. So, I'm pretty sure the hackers here and the artists here can, you know, can can do or can think of ways to use this um, in in productive uh, ways. But uh, at least we have a paper that is exploring that possibility and that is available in the internet. So all of these are uh, possible entries when you are on the other side of the screen, which is a very um, non-powerful side of the screen. Uh, let's say when you're dealing with, uh, with commercial massive large models. But what happens when you are inside? So I was thinking about this because the original movie that gave the name to the gaslighting strategy or thingy was a movie from uh, 1944 where Charles Boyer is trying to convince his wife that she is crazy so he can put her in an asylum and basically spend all her money. And it's called Gaslight because one of the things that he, well, he does things like hiding her things and when she's like, oh, I don't find my purse, I don't find my gloves, he's like, yes, because you're crazy. And, uh, uh, one of the things that he does is like he deems the lights in the house but doesn't tell her. Which sounds very ridiculous, like how can you drive someone crazy like that? But when you think that lights in the house were actually literally coming from gas, uh, the idea of the gas, uh, the lights coming down probably was a sign that you were about to be gas poisoned or uh, your house was about to explode. So yeah. Poor Ingrid Berman spends the whole movie looking at the lamps in this, um, in this altered state, thinking that her house is gonna explode because she's, she's too crazy to notice when the lights are down and the gas is like, you know, leaking uh, everywhere in the building. So uh, I was thinking, is there a way that we could, I don't know, maybe alter the state of the infrastructure itself in a way that would lead to some changes in the AI? And the answer quickly became no. <laughs> because as you are probably know, uh, data centers are like detention centers. They are in the middle of nowhere and they are guarded by security, guns, dogs, uh, copyright laws, terrorism laws, and all sorts of uh, encryption and, uh, and protections. So uh, no one can actually alter the state of anything, not even the people working inside. So the next phase of the uh, gaslighting AI project would be the teaching of the AI, or how they call it in the field, the fine tuning of the AI. So there is two kinds of fine tuning. One is the gross side, and this is basically the moderation. And moderating AI is very easy. So uh, one of the things we could do would be to get a job. It's very easy to get a job moderating AI. And it's not, uh, you know, it's available pretty much everywhere because, as you probably know, data centers for AI are coming to us very quickly because, you know, they need a lot of processing speed, which means that they need uh, the users to be closer to the machine. But they suck. 
one of the things that we know about these jobs from the people that have done it is that it will ruin your life. So probably is a lot of sacrifice if uh, some of us want to become uh, the Mata Harris of this field. But thinking about it, there is already a lot of people working there and they are very poorly paid. So I thought, I mean, if this Fox Tomation class uh, is earning $2 or less than $2 an hour, we could probably hire them in secret to modify the teaching of the AI uh, uh, in mass. So this is obviously something that I cannot uh, pay out of pocket myself, but maybe some uh, generous foundation that is very concerned about the state of the AI and the, and the kind of things that it's gonna do to all of us, maybe could think about a project like this. Which takes me to my favorite, 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 I'm a journalist, favorite story in the whole year. Maybe, I don't know if story, but definitely my favorite headline in the whole year. Google apologizes for missing the mark after generated racially diverse Nazis. <laughs> this happened two weeks ago. There was no way to generating white people in Gemini. <laughs> and the first thing that they noticed, and when I say they, I mean American Nazis, was that their Nazis were black, which is like, you know, we're fine with the AI being racist, having gender issues, being homophobic, uh, and, you know, all the things that we know about AI, but black Nazis, now that is that. <laughs> and so what happened was that Google was trying to correct some of the biases that are endemic and natural uh, to, um, to generative models, and uh, somehow they went a bit too far. And uh, they were trying to come out with Gemini as better than the OpenAI model, uh, ChatGPT, and they didn't make it. <laughs> it didn't work out. And uh, in this case, ChatGPT won <laughs> because it could make white people, put white people in the right places. So, um, I had a different slide next, which was the slide with a tweet that one of the main engineers in, uh, of Gemini uh, had a burst in Twitter saying, because well, I hate Nazis and Nazis have to go and this mistake was a good mistake. And like, but the whole uh, right wing um, blogosphere, sorry, Twitter sphere kind of um, uh, gave him a bit of a beating. So this tweet has disappeared and I cannot find it. But the lesson here is that the most relevant, important person in the company, the one that can inject, that can data poison the model more effectively, is obviously the top engineer, which takes me to what I think is the biggest and the best point of entry in the field. So how many of you know um, Ilya Sutskever? A few people. Okay, so Ilya Sutskever is um, the main designer of ChatGPT, or, or um, uh, GPT, uh, ChatGPT and GPT models in general. And uh, it so happened that last November, the other important person in OpenAI, uh, Sam Altman, was fired was fired out of nowhere from one day to the next. He couldn't enter his own building, and it was like one of the funniest, fastest, and most exhausting um, news in the field for uh, all of us tech journalists. And what happened was that Ilya and uh, a whole number of people in the board have decided that this man, believe it or not, was not reliable, was not a reliable narrator, actually, and so they kick him out. He's the money man. He's the one that gets the money. And so he was more or less back in three days. In less than three days, he was back. And um, of course, he fired the whole board that uh, kicked him out. But he cannot fire Ilya because, you know, he is the engineer. A number of things happened uh, in the following weeks where Ilya did a whole lot of things uh, to express his regret in attempting to kill Sam Altman as the CEO of his company. I really like this photograph because it's like, Sam is going like, so, how high? How, how deeply you regret this? And he's like, real deep? Um, didn't really work out. Sam um, came back, fired anyone but Ilya. But then, I really, really like this one. It says, everyone, even Microsoft, has a seat at the new OpenAI board except for Ilya Sutskever.
which is like the most important guy in the company. And then two months later, he was saying, like a few weeks ago, he was saying, Sam Alman isn't sure if Ilias Escaver is even still working at AI. So why do I think he's the most vulnerable point of the whole um, industry? This is the biggest company in the field, and this is the biggest expert in the field. When Geoffrey Hinton, which is one of the three godfathers of artificial intelligence, created the whole Transformers thing, he was there in his team. Like, he is probably one of the five people that are the best, the top, the absolute, like, tops of the field. I don't know who's the guy in the middle. <laughs> and so, if this guy is at a company where his presence is not simpatico to his uh, boss. He doesn't have any power, but he has to do all the job. I bet he would be available for a number of things. I'm not the only one that thinks it. Elon Musk wants Ilias Utskever to work for him, to work again for him, he says, because um, OpenAI was a foundation that he also uh, founded at the very, very beginning. And, uh, and I'm pretty sure the reason why he wants Ilya is because he's been trying really, really hard to gaslight his own AI and make him say that he's, fe he's a free speech absolutist, but his own AI keeps saying that he is the opera of censorship. <laughs> so I bet he's not very happy about this. Well, going back to reality, the truth is the only case study that I have for someone on this side of the screen actually implementing an attack and succeeding in changing um, a uh, large language model has been uh, the narcissistic Kevin Roos. I hope he doesn't sue me for this. But the thing is, we do have a very, very strong vulnerability against uh, this uh, LLMs, which is that we are very lonely people these days. We've been trained for other algorithms uh, to basically spend more time in our phones than uh, with our loved ones. And this is an industry that is predating not our eyes and our fingers, but our ears. And if you have seen uh, a Spike John's movie, Her, which I highly recommend because it has gotten a lot better with time, you will know that they will certainly, if we are feeling a little bit lonely, they will be the ones that gaslight us. I mean, even, uh, I was thinking before that even the director is gaslighting us, all of us, with the movie because he pretends that the AI is just like an operating system that lives in a box, but he chose the voice of a Scarlett Johansson <laughs> for the operating system that seduces the protagonist. And I thought that this is exactly how it's gonna go. This is Replica, which is a company, like an app, that makes boyfriends and girlfriends for its users that are synthetic. And I'm pretty sure these boyfriends and girlfriends will have the voice of our loved ones or of the characters that we adore or people that are not really in our lives anymore but have a very, very big emotional impact on us. So I think the only way to protect ourselves from AI is basically connection and community. So I will say, if you can make communities around you, if you can talk to your neighbors, there's a lot of very, very lonely people living by themselves in our neighborhoods that we never talk to. If you can create community gardens or um, energy cooperatives or, you know, get them to protest with you about whatever random things, maybe that would be the way. Also, since there's a lot of hackers in this room, if you can make devices that don't connect to a server that connects to another server that collects all the information to basically gaslight us. If you make devices or applications or software that connects directly to the people around you, maybe we will have a chance. Because I'm pretty sure uh, we all want to live in a world where we don't have to gaslight anyone, not even the AI, and we can uh, survive these perilous times uh, Yes, uh, being content and prosperous. Thank you.